Hello, and welcome to the Voice of Reason podcast. Today's guest is Roderick Graham, who is an associate professor of sociology. And in this conversation, we take a sociological lens towards um, various calls to defund the police, uh, various conceptions of uh, police community relationships and disparities between different populations. It's a very intellectual and engaging discourse. And so I'll get out of the way and introduce you to Roderick Graham. We can do this a couple ways. I, I want to get to sociology, but I'd like to know like as much of your biography as you want, just to couch like the way that you think and sure. how you grew up and how you live. So, you, do you want to do the superhero origin story, or or you want to <laughs> start with what sociology is and why that's um, cool for you? You know what? Maybe I should start with the background because that might uh, contextualize the way that I the way that I think about sociology and also some. Uh, social cultural issues so sure let's do the superman story you okay, can start no at year zero or maybe like 1986 <laughs> if you want whatever magic year you think is okay so maybe that's a little too far back but i guess in general um you know grew up in south carolina um <laughs> poor but the whole town was poor so you kind of don't know that stuff until you experience uh, uh different ways of living so and um so since we'll be talking about race, I guess uh, the school that I went to was uh, integrated, but it was clearly blacks over here, whites over here. So this was the uh, 80s. Uh, it's much different now, but, but in the 80s, that's how it was. And so anyway, um, I graduated high school, and I wanted, I thought that I wanted to be a high, sc- uh, high school biology teacher. So that, that was my first career, and I did that for a couple of years. And um, I don't have any horror stories, you know, like no spitballs were thrown at me or something like that. I just realized that I wanted to do something else. And so I went back to school. And it's, the thing is, I knew nothing about education. I, it was just a, a series of like <laughs> just doing things kind of on a whim. Like like I went to college. I didn't know anything about going to college. I just said, well, OK, I'll go. My, my high school grades weren't that good. But I'd scored high on the, on the SAT, so I was able to get into the colleges. But my, I think my high school average was a C or something, so I was not a good student. Um, so I just went off to college anywhere, uh, South Carolina State. So then I was in a bookstore, and I read this book called Sociobiology, which is really weird. It's a famous book by E.O. Wilson, as I understand it, but it has nothing really to do with sociology. But I thought, oh, I see, you know. I'm teaching biology, I'm interested in social issues, and so, ah, I, I can go study social biology, and of course that's not how it works. So I went off to graduate school, and they're like, no, that's not what we do here. But at the University of South Carolina, they were doing experiments as sociologists. So it's very different than um, probably what most people would think about sociology. They had us um, using computers to put people into groups and then and then doing experiments like okay how would you you are a part of group a you know and that would be students around computers that were a computers it's, it's kind of weird uh and then and then we'd have in another room group uh students who are group b and the idea was to activate this abstract idea of groups yeah. and then to see how people would interact and they built mathematical models predicting you know how much would people share their resources without groups and in groups it was kind of interesting that's important because I took that biology and then that somewhat mathematical sociology with me so it made it harder for me to you know take the the Marxist um, um, critical theory approach that I then had when I went to the Graduate Center at City University of New York so that's where I got my PhD from. So they were doing things that would be more traditional uh, sociology, but I had this background, which made it, which made it a bit hard for me to accept all of that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I see some value in it, but uh, because my background started me along this hard science path, yeah, um, that still is with me. So is so it now fair to say that it doesn't work for you because it can't be falsified or you can't test it? There, it's not testable in a way. Is that? part of it? Well, I, I started with the idea that that, that um, some critical theory, so, so there are three ways of doing uh, social, sociological research, and the one, that peop- the one way that people are most concerned about is critical theory. 
uh, it's the overly political research, which is about, I don't know, 10 or 50 percent of all sociology. So, so when I experienced that, I said, well, this is inferior. That was my first idea. That was actually me being naive, actually. I know a little bit more now. Um, I don't do that kind of work, but I appreciate it now a little bit more. I understand what the function of it is. That's not to say that sometimes it, it goes off the rails, but I, I probably have a, a, a greater appreciation of it now. Okay. Yeah. Would you be able to summarize what you mean by the function of it, or could you contextualize like what is the positive function of critical theory with regards mm. to, I guess, shaping sociology or understanding uh, sociological behavior? Right, sure. So critical theory is expressly political, and they want it to be so. And uh, the idea is uh, they, are, they are trying to address oppression and inequality using um, research. So I, I guess in, in some ways the way that I think about it is you've got biology and then you've got applied biology. And so a biologist will try and learn the general rules of biology, whatever that may be. Um, and then an applied biologist would then use it in some way. And so that's kind of the way that I think about critical theory, is that they're not trying to come up with uh, 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 some falsifiable laws of human behavior. They're saying, okay, we want to deal with oppression. What do we know? How can we research this? What's a usable, practical idea that mm -hmm. we, can, we can put into play? Um, in fact, one of the critiques that I have of the critiques of things like white fragility uh, is that you're, you're trying to... Uh, uh, measure the value of that using enlightenment era you know, scientific uh, uh, measures like oh can it be falsified is there a clear definition you know this type of stuff and that's that's fine uh, if you want to go back to the classroom or the computer and and study it that way but for critical theorists that's immaterial it doesn't matter hmm. they're saying look this is wonderful because we got people talking about this I can I can give it's like a, a field manual. I can give this white fragility book to a diversity person and they can go into the field and use that and that's the value of it. So um, it might be that those critiques, uh, I think Jonathan, Jonathan Church does some good work on this. Those critiques of white fragility are good critiques. It's just that it might be missing the point sometimes. Mm, okay. So you yeah. got people talking past each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, would you not want to measure how, let's just say, for example, Robin DiAngelo's teachings uh, have an effect on a society? Would that not be a valid way of critiquing? Like, well, what happens when a, a, a school takes her ideas as gospel and then acts accordingly and and what's the outcome of that is that a measurable way of seeing the validity of those ideas or at least the uh the power and the outcome of them you can certainly measure those things and they they need to be someone other than the critical scholar would need to use their skills to see mm -hmm. um how valid those ideas are in the long run um and and that's that's one of the problems is that you you know what tends to happen is critical scholars, they produce a lot of sexy ideas and they get used by writers and activists uh, and they're fine with that. Uh, critical scholars are, that's what they want to do. But there needs to be a, a, another group of people in sociology who can then say, okay, fine, you may have in it, um, found some kernel of truth here so let's further specify this. Um, I, don't, I don't doubt that people in the abstract react to being stigmatized by defending themselves, which is basically what white fragility is. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a kernel of truth in that. But then you, you got to then say, OK, this is general human behavior. Um, under what conditions will this happen? Um, uh, and then go from there. And that would be a more uh, uh, standard way of doing it. And how does your uh, your discipline or the practice of your discipline uh, differ or uh, part ways with the critical theorists? What are you uh, focusing on or interested in? You mean my, my research? My research. Your itself, research, or, or just uh, your broader, just your broader uh, wanting to engage in a broader conversation, or the research specifically. Hmm. Actually, it's two different questions. So my research is actually about cybercrime and online oh. behavior. So it's very, <laughs> it's very out there. I, I, it's not about 
sometimes it intersects with race because my earlier work dealt with race and technology, but given my school and uh, the emphasis on the cyber stuff, I've focused more on um, online behavior as it relates to crime and deviance. So that's what I've been doing. So that's very different hmm. than okay. than um, my comments on critical theory. I think the reason why I started talking about this stuff is one, after tenure, I had time to be more public uh, as a scholar. That's the first thing. And second, I teach research methods. And so it, it gives me a real inside baseball look at how these things operate. And I, and I would see critiques of critical theory. And I said, you know what, they got some of this right, but not a lot. And so I think I think last year I wrote a piece for Art Digital where I was talking about the, um, what is it called? The grievance studies hoax work mm -hmm. done by uh, James Lindsay et al. And so uh, that was one of my critiques was that, you know, they got some of that right, but they're missing the point on it. And I, and I think that's somehow how mm -hmm. we ended up, I'm not quite sure how we, how it got to the point that me and you connected, but that must have been that path, something like that. Because mm -hmm. I wrote a piece for Ariel, where I talked about whiteness studies, and that's how I met Iona, something like that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a Pamela Parinsky, uh, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, a retweet of, of hers. She just turned me on to, to your work, and it seemed like you're trying to forge a different place in in this uh -huh. multifaceted conversation that can get kind of rowdy and in it getting rowdy it kind of loses a lot of that sacred nuance that we're all uh, pining mm -hmm. about all the time <laughs> and then, yeah yeah and then uh flipping over the table of it so um cybercrime is cool you you said the word deviance do you mean just like not just stealing things but like uh some sort of aberrant behavior beyond uh theft sure anything in the that cyber uh, world? oh yeah anything that is uh not the norm but it may not be a crime so hmm. um oh, recently cyberbullying is has been uh, Bullying, criminalized yeah. but uh okay. it yeah. before it was just a you know deviant behavior this is a this is probably a pretty big question so maybe you'll have some insight into it what do you think about there, there's a lot of uh, self-policing going on right now and I've read some articles and I've gotten some anecdotes about specifically college level students and high school level students now highly policing one another's behavior around mm -hmm. the topic of race but if we ex abstract it from you know you're either on the bandwagon or you're not supporting us and therefore you're off what do you think about that phenomena and as it applies to the internet and social media and how maybe dangerous that is and ways that uh our society has yet to adapt to the power of this technology with regards to uh i guess uh stigmatization and uh and group thinking uh well so um in the classroom setting it would be nice if students are free to say what they want. Students do self-police. So when I do teach a class on race, I don't teach it often, but sometimes, uh, it is the case that uh, when I do have white students in the class, they make sure that they don't say something that might offend the non-white students. I used to really say, okay, you know, we have to get past this. Let's try and, um, you know, allow people to speak respectfully, of course, but, you know, voice their opinions. And my thinking is that I'm an old man and and the, the, the norms of society have shifted hmm. and I'm just not aware of those shifting norms or I, or, or I don't want to accept them. So, um, so one argument would be that we have less free, we have less free speech. I, I, I can't say what I want to say now because I might get canceled. That's actually true. Um, that uh, that you can get canceled, but I, I would I'm starting to think that there might be so this is, a, this is a nuanced thing here. So let me see if I can unpack it. The penalties for saying certain things are greater today, maybe because of the technology, as you pointed out. However, it's not the case that the range of what we can say is less. So I, I had a I had a a, a colleague who uh, went through uh, top surgery, um, where uh, they uh, remove, I, I think they removed their breasts you know, to become more who they want to be. And, and, that, and that scholar could talk about this openly. 
I don't think she could have done that uh, 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, in fact, one of the videos that I made, I, I went through like a historical progression of the things that you could not say that would have gotten you canceled. Yeah. So uh, um, imagine, imagine, you know, it's 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 1840, and and two white men are, you know, talking with each other, and one of the white men says, you know, that 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 uh, that slave over there, that that farmhand, he's quite competent. I think, you know, we should set him free, and I think he could probably do a good job of, you know, he's really good with with uh, handling the nails and the wood, so he might be a good mayor. Well. He can't say that. You'll be run out of town. That guy would be canceled, right? You can't. You can't say those kind of things. So, in in all epics of uh, civilization, there have always been things that you can't say. I would I would suggest that the we may actually have more free speech today than ever before. It's just that there are you. It's certainly certainly the case that there's some things you cannot say, and those things, the consequences are so severe, and and that's a problem. So. Mm. You, you brought up changing norms, but if given your old man status, which I, I have a hard time seeing as an old man, but I'll, I'll just put that on. <laughs> yeah, right I'm, I'm up there, brother. I'm up there. Man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the changing norms. Can't you, from from a you know from a more experienced and learned perspective, see that norms uh, create um, I, like if the norm becomes too constricting, uh, what does that do on the effect of a, the health of the body politic? And will it lead to, I don't know if you believe in some sort of pendulum theory, or if you've seen evidence that the pendulum <clears throat> of what is a norm or how norms are enforced kind of changes over time. And, you know, back in like, the 80s, 90s, the Christian right uh, was very censorious and, and they were depicted in movies as being, you know, very like you can't dance in the town square, you know, and they were kind of the the ones who were policing everybody's discourse. And now it's this odd uh, resurgence of that same kind of behavior of policing, uh, you know, policing behavior. But it's coming from the left now. And if that, if there's a um, kind of uh, some need to temper the tightening of norms or the the enforcement of norms, because it will choke out certain aspects of a society. Um, and I guess how would one do that if if that was if you did think that that the kid the college kids these days are being uh-huh. too hot under the collar about things mm-hmm. uh, maybe maybe you think that maybe you don't if you do think that how would you um, propose that they change or influence kind of a a lessening of that um, oh that's the thing though so I initially I would I would resist that because I have a certain set of values about what proper communication would be. And so I wanted those students to say, okay, to say, all right, even though this person doesn't agree with me or he's voicing an opinion that I don't agree with, I'm gonna let that person you know, make that statement. But what I was doing uh, was trying to impose that, those communicative values on those students. Mm, and mm-hmm. maybe uh, and looking back I'm, I'm thinking oh you know you know they have a lot of free speech within their own cohort just not that <laughs> so the, the, there's a lot more that they will talk about now that would have been so restrictive if I was in their seats 20 years ago I mean it's it's amazing the things you know the sex the drugs and all that kind of stuff mm, uh, it's, okay. it's 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 open right so so I'm just mm. thinking that they would have no idea that what I'm telling them to do is a is a good thing, to allow that person to say something about. And, and let me make it more clear, make it more practical, based on my class. So I teach a class on racial inequality, and um, it's not a theory class. So I'm a little free to instead of teaching what the discipline, uh, a standard racial inequality class would teach, where it's about theory and research, I make it somewhat political. Um, and I say, okay, there are four ways of explaining racial inequality. And so those four ways are, uh, let's say, far right. So that would be taking a rigid biological view that, you know, these you know, black and white people are different. And that explains the inequality, right? Then you have a center right view, which looks at culture uh, and says, well, you know, it's just cultural differences. If if one group changes, then you know their outcomes will change, right? 
-hmm. Those two views are not what students want to talk about. So because one is biological racism and one would be considered cultural racism. Mm. And so I want mm. to talk about those things in class, but my students will say, oh, why are we talking about this? This is, this makes no sense. If, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm trying to understand their logic because I'm thinking if I walked into a class and said, okay, let's talk about Jews running the world. They would look at me like I was crazy because it's so far out there, right? Yeah. So me wanting to talk about cultural racism as a serious thing or biological racism, they're thinking, what? Is, this is so far out there. It makes no sense. It's it's a that's a taboo almost in a way. Kind of like if the I'm Overton window sense. has shifted where that's just no longer acceptable even to think about, let alone discuss, perhaps. Maybe. I don't know what the Overton window is, actually. It's it's a, it's a concept of the acceptable bounds of discourse, and if you can shape what people can talk about, you can kind of shape how the body moves. Like uh, one example from current politic is that you have the uh, the Democratic Party has been shifted more and more left by you know AOC's cohort, which are making these really strong leftist Bernie demands, these social mm -hmm. socialist demands that are forcing the the party. To, to focus on, on their views and, and kind of leaving the centrists and the neoliberals kind of out of the conversation. Mm. So it's just yeah. a, the, the okay. acceptable realm of, uh, uh, range of discourse, the overtime okay. window. So, what it, so it seems to me that they are operating under uh, the, uh, I guess, the supposition that all racism is derived from like a systemic. You didn't describe the left side of theory. Okay, so yeah. Theory. So, the left would be, um, I guess, center left would be that there are pockets of bad behavior. So, maybe bad apples in the police force hmm. or. Uh, every now and then you might have a, a kooky um, a person who says some kind of racial, racially insensitive things. But overall, things are working. We can just deal with those issues and uh, our institutions work fine. That would be like a center left view. And then a far left view would be, uh, yes, it's systemic. Like, like it's uh, society is racist at its core. And um, attitudes, uh, behaviors, the laws, the policies, all of these things uh, impact uh, black people specifically, but also non-whites, I guess, in general, uh, affect them negatively. Mm -hmm. And so those two sides, I am I was painting them at the beginning of that class as left sides. It, I'm starting to think that that's just the world, like that's just the way people think. So, so there's some people who still, a small percentage, who still take the cultural and the biological very few take the biological, and then a, but a, a larger group would take the cultural view but that's becoming not only a minority view, but almost a, a taboo view mm -hmm. because the majority of young people take the structural and the um, individual racism view. Oh, individual racism. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so this, um, all this talk recently about systemic racism and policing, academics have been talking about that for a long time, yeah. but, the, but, but people weren't ready for that. And, but I think that the young, you know, it's like, it's like a cohort effect, you know. So people 30 and below, oh yeah, makes sense. <laughs> like they're ready to, to accept that idea and, and that's probably what's pushing a, a lot of the, the dialogue now. Do you, do you think, uh, having studied criminology, do you have much knowledge about policing beyond the cyber realm? or Just a any, little. Do you have any uh, opinions on... Uh, a society that doesn't have or has a different sort of policing in place? Do you have a strong kind of oh, nose for where it's going to go? Where no, you would like it to go? Oh, okay. So, well, yeah, my opinions are, I, I think that uh, the idea that there's a lot of contact between police and minorities and that's generating a lot of the issues, I, I, I buy that. Um, I also... In some ways, it does actually connect to uh, cybercrime a little. The, re the research that I'm working on now specifically is internet-facilitated sex work and sex trafficking. Uh, and there's this debate going on about, okay, you know, should we legalize uh, sex work or decriminalize it, I think is the way that it's talked about, and will that lead to more sex trafficking, on and on and on. So in any case, a lot of the complaints coming from sex workers are that police are just in their face too much. 
like like there, there's this there's this tension between the sex workers and police and why are they there you know why, why are they doing stings on on this victimless crime you're, you're they have to do that because that's what you know society tells them to do but is that really the best use of their time you know and so i i can see i can see how that works and so it might be that yes i mean if we could shift policing to more to things that are more violent or more serious and leave some of those other issues uh public disorder issues uh mental health homelessness all this type of stuff even the police in schools um the uh sro's uh student resource officers or something i can't remember hmm. what the acronym stands for but but those are cops with guns in the school um that may also need to change you may need to have someone who's experienced working with youth who can protect people but but may, may not necessarily be a police hmm. uh the a police officer the data at this point um is starting to be kind of clear that when it comes to shootings there's no racial differences in fact some studies say that whites are shot more, um, but when it comes to non-lethal violence, um, the data is pretty clear that uh, uh, black people suffer more from that. Uh, race matters when it comes to non-lethal violence, and so uh, if you want to deal with that, then um, hmm. some changes are in order. Yeah, what's grabbing your attention most about what's going on right now? Uh, not the COVID stuff, but the the kind of the the BLM and and the associated uh, up, uprising or outburst going on. What what what's uh, kind of like tingling your sociological spidey sense? Or... It's just like why, like like why now? Like I, I think that George that George Floyd video was the ideal video for. It was very symbolic in so many ways, like the cops uh, around, you know, you could see a guy dying there and the, the, the person, Derek Chauvin, I mean, he's a um, square jawed guy. I mean, he looks like he could be a stock character in a film. Uh, I mean, so it, it just was a it was a it was a video that that could do everything. Now, George Floyd is not the ideal victim um, in a sense that no one says that he should have died. But obviously he wasn't an angel. But the video itself is ideal and so I, I think that is elicited a lot also those cohort effects that um, I mentioned earlier I mean it's just like this is unusual uh, un, un, unprecedented because we've had these things come up before uh, in Ferguson and even Rodney, Rodney King to some yeah. extent but this is multi-racial um, and um, uh, Black Lives Matter has been getting a lot of uh, support yeah there's uh, there's a lot of interesting symbology that's popping up. I don't know if this is something that that uh, rings with you or resonates with you on a sociological level. So I still don't understand what what sociology you practice. So, but I'm just going to throw that out there. Like, there's these wa washing okay. of feet, and there, another video popped up uh, this past weekend about there was uh, white people with these. I think it was makeup, but they had uh, lashes on their back, and they mm -hmm. they had chains on, and they were being walked around by black people with the sign like, "What if this was your history?" Like, there's a lot of um, very strong symbols, and uh, people are playing with yeah. these very strong cultural icons, and. Um, Part of my interest is kind of just sussing that out on what it means, but also trying to trace the effects that it has on on reconfigurating how we consider our society, how it's put together, and then how we go forward and and change it. I'm wondering if if those things uh, are signals to you, or if they they uh, pop up in how you study group behavior. I see. Okay, so uh, as a sociologist, I'm a quantitative sociologist. I deal more with. Uh surveys and, and, and data points. So in so the type of sociologist who would try and understand those symbols uh, would be, I guess, a qualitative sociologist or an okay. interpretive sociologist. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that I don't I don't I don't pay attention to it. And um, I I'm actually surprised that people would do that. Um, it would be interesting if someone would actually be go into that scene like an anthropologist and talk to people and find out what it is that's going on. Mm. Um, one of the reasons why I started, why I'm trying to become more public in my sociology is I'm starting to realize that we, we don't know a lot and, we, and what we do is this surface level uh, discourse. So let's say I, I turn on the CNN or something and there's some talking head there, I guess we're talking heads now, 
but but this one's on CNN and 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 they're saying, okay, I'm going to tell you about um, why white people in the Midwest are racist. All right, that's that person's claim. And then he talks for 25 minutes, but he's never been there. He's never spoken with anyone. He's just read some, you know, read some documents and and came to some conclusion. That's a mistake because you're 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 turning people who are um, three-dimensional and you know they've got a lot going on in their lives into these cardboard characters and so yeah. and so I'm, I'm saying that because to understand why people would kneel you know like you had the white the white people kneeling uh, you know that video I think it was in Houston or, or something the white people kneeling uh, and the three or four black people standing there I have no idea why yeah. and uh, it would be a it would be uh, almost like malpractice in a way to, to try and assert what they're doing. Huh. Right? I, you just don't know without yeah. being in the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, that's a good point. How do you how do you go public though with ignorance? How do you how do you champion ignorance? Uh, I guess the the one way to dress it up <laughs> is humility. <laughs> how but how do you how do you say we don't know anything? You know, <laughs> I don't know, man. That's that's a tough one. Um, I mean, I guess I could I could just advocate for you know taking a more measured approach to things. I don't know, but yeah, you're right. No one wants to <laughs> be told that they don't know what they're talking about. So. Um, well, I mean, I don't even know how you would talk for 20 minutes on your YouTube channel about not knowing anything. I guess it, that just has to be assumed <laughs> <laughs> while you're talking about something that you don't know about. But <laughs> no, okay, well, let's say, okay, here would be a good example. Um, let's say, okay, we're talking about, let's say two people are talking about COVID. All right. Yeah. We're, we may have our political values about and, and apply them to how we deal with the virus. So if you're a conservative, you may say, okay, look, um, I understand that we don't want a lot of deaths, but we're also losing a lot of jobs with all these lockdowns, um, or with this extended lockdown. So, so we have to take that into account. If you're on the left, you may say, okay, you know, hmm, you know, this is good for us. If uh, if we can keep the, everything locked down, maybe uh, the the public get upset, and then then um, and then they'll vote Trump out, along with the fact that we're saving lives. You know, so it's, <laughs> I'm not, I don't I don't want to be that cynical. Obviously, they want to uh, save lives. So anyway, um, you know, you. You can use your values, but you bring on an epidemiologist somewhere in that discourse you know, over the two or three weeks that you're talking about it, just to ground it in facts. And people do that; they do that. Yeah. Now. Okay. So, um, yeah, you know, but they may not necessarily do it with a lot of uh, social patterns. So they'll they'll they won't they'll never do that back and forth. Um, well, they do it a lot with things like marriage and family. Like I, I notice they, they're happy. People are happy to bring on a marriage and family expert, but but I almost never hear, at least on the right, that they okay. You deal with police brutality. Let's bring on this criminologist, and then we go from there. You know, they won't do that. And I guess maybe it's because yeah. that criminologist might produce some knowledge that they don't want to hear. Yeah. But but still, you you're being really negligent if you're not using that information. Hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's got to be some kind of uh, back and forth. So, for example, on your channel, you interview a lot of people who are uh, experts to some degree in something. A lot of times, sometimes I don't know. Like I, I watched an interview with the the guy in the car. I was like, "What's that about?" So, yeah, I watched <laughs> Jericho bit. Green. He's just, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's the guy Green. in the car. <laughs> but um, oh, Alexa thought I was asking it something. Um, and so, but 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 you bring on different people, and that that gives you a a more nuanced view of things. Although it's certainly bent in one direction, uh, yeah. because that's what you're interested in. But still, you're getting some information. You as a this is a pattern that I recognize in trained scientists, if I may ascribe to you that label. It seems like you're I like pretty. That label. Yes, a you're scientist. fine with that. Um, mm. That you guys are very careful when it comes to your discipline. And and that just knowing knowing so well how to do that one thing scientifically, maybe it it seems that you then carry that attitude of of kind of respecting ignorance being everywhere and and trying to approach data from us. I'm trying to formulate this into a question, but I'm also trying to like formulate this attitude that I that I noticed from you and other scholars specifically, especially quantitative scholars about 
having it like an epistemic humility. Um, but does is that is that not exhausting in a way, or do you just ha- kind of have to zen out in order to just accept that there's just falseness or unfalsifiability wherever you go? Like, how did you get your bearings? Like, once you realized how little you knew about the world. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I actually, I, I don't think about it that way. I, I yeah. guess it's more that you just you just stay a skeptic, or or you just know that there's so much you don't know, and so you just keep kind of hacking away at it like a block of marble. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe eventually you make a David or something. Do you, you feel called to to do action though? It, it seems like with the core, the cohort, the under thirty cohort, they're they're being called in an urgent manner to do something. Like I don't know how you maintain that. Like like when you're called to do something, how do you maintain that skepticism? Um, Were well, you ever okay. put in that position? Like you have to change the world and. A lot of young, a lot of young people, just by, by being young people, you know, they they're idealistic, so they're gonna they're gonna do that regardless. If they're if they're learning in social science departments now, there is a strong push for activism, because many of the scholars, not most, not at all, but many of the scholars, and the popular ones are critical in their orientation and activists. Even if they're not critical in their scholarship, they they can be activists uh, out, outside of their scholarship. So it's a kind of a mix. But um, that's very popular and that and that, that can push, you know, they're popular and that can certainly push students. So all of those ideas, as you know more than I do, are generated uh, in academic departments and then they trickle out into the world. Mm-hmm. In my case though, I've, I have not been uh, an activist. Uh, never have, although now I'm starting to write more about stuff uh, that I see. Such as? Is well, there a pattern so, in what you're looking at? Or? Um, well, whenever I do research on something, I, I, I try to formulate it in simple ways and then write about it for the public. Um, so I've written a textbook. I'm working on one now. So, um, I don't know, ten, 10 students might buy it. I don't know. But, uh, I, there's joy in writing, so I, I do well, at it least anyway. it'll be uh, priced at $1,500. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I have a conscience. I, I try to keep it uh, yeah, uh, under a certain um, <laughs> link so that it's not that expensive. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, textbooks can be pricey. But um, I actually, I actually would like it if more if more scholars would write for the public, just to just to get that information out there, and then people can use their political values and say, okay, well, you know, thanks for that data. Um, but you know, I think that our world should work this way, but at least that data would be out there, and we don't always have it. Do you, are you concerned about the path that academia is taking? Do you, do you feel like the quantitative uh, realm of academia is pretty shored up and is going to continue? Um, there's some alarmism, and I just wanted to know if you think it's alarmism about encroaching uh, values in the academy, or if it's blown out of proportion. Mm, so I, you know, I, I guess I could break that into two questions. So, one would be about the um, encroaching or the or the reduction of quantitative scholarship, and then I guess the other one would be about value. So, um, it seems as if critical scholarship is growing, is in the ascendancy in the academy. Um, w- what the exact percentage, uh, like what is it compared to other types of scholarship? I don't know. Um, but it's certainly very popular and students like it and that drives a lot of it. Uh, you, could, you could be a graduate student who's thinking about um, how, what they should study and you see this scholar um, who gets her book or his book on the New York Times uh, bestseller list getting interviewed by all of these uh, um, news outlets and media outlets and it's like oh I want to do that and then they follow that, that person so, so you know yeah. And and by saying that, uh, I'm actually pointing the finger at the media in a way, you know, for just grabbing these uh, sexy concepts and running with them and, and turning these uh, academics into uh, kind of stars. Ironically, though, all of the f- research funding, like they're not going to give you a grant if you don't demonstrate uh, solid research methods that will lead to uh, generalizable results. 
So most of the grant funding does not go to critical scholarship. It goes to uh, people who are doing quantitative work like me or a type of qualitative work that's not value oriented. So, so going and interview people, interviewing people is, is, is just another way of collecting data. It's just not numbers. But it doesn't have to be value oriented. You're just trying to find out what's going on in the scene. Okay. So, so those people get, those people get the grant funding because funders know that this is the most reliable, over time way of collecting information. So, so yeah, it's in a sense. Now, when it comes to values, I have a different take on this actually. So, it is absolutely true that most social science scientists, especially in sociology and the um, sociology adjacent disciplines, media studies and uh, feminist, uh, women's studies, you know, these type of uh, race and ethnic, ethnic studies. Uh, it's certainly the case that they're progressive. That's a problem. But I don't think it's the problem that people, so what, what happens is you, someone will say, well, this scholar is a leftist, therefore the knowledge he or she produces is invalid. That's a mistake. If they're following proper research methods, which 90% do, then the reality, they're producing knowledge. It's just that the questions they're asking aren't the ones that conservatives would want uh, answered. So they're starting by saying, okay, um, where, you know, what degree of uh, these hiring practices are about racism? All right. Well, if you ask that question, you're going to get that answer, right? Uh, so, so it's not. So it is the case that there's uh, clearly uh, progressives, uh, liberals, and social science, but it doesn't invalidate the research. Instead, what needs to happen is I don't know how this would happen, but you know, there needs to be a uh, some funding or some support for asking questions conservatives are interested in. Okay. And then you'll get those answers, right? I don't know how that would, would, would work, but uh, mm. um, I think the Koch, uh, in my, I think it's the Koch brothers. The Koch brothers have done that, and I think there's one remaining. I think one died recently, but uh, but, but but they have been in uh, uh, funding scholarship that's about entrepreneurship. It's about American values. It's about the family. Things that conservatives are interested in. Yeah. Well, going back to that uh, classroom discussion about race, if you're not if you're not even thinking that asking about biology is is valid, then you're not going to ask about biology. If you don't even think culture has an impact on how human beings in aggregate the outcomes that you know, if there's no connection between culture and the outcomes of an individual in that culture, then you're not even going to be looking at it. And it just seems like th that's, um, it seems like the, I guess you're saying funding would probably be the best way to do that. And I would agree with you, but because you couldn't, unless you have some sort of, um, meta, um, question generator that just asks questions and just mm -hmm. tries to really fill out knowledge rather than forward knowledge. But people ask questions based on what they're interested in and in, or what That's they true. already see beforehand. Mm -hmm. how, is, uh, how is your work, uh, your technical work, different than that? Did, did, are you kind of assigned an idea and then you kind of riff on it until you figure out a new way of looking at the data? Or like what drives your uh, progression of, of research? Uh, well, you're right. You start with what you're interested in. So I was interested in technology. Uh, I was interested in, in black people and their outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and because I thought differently, uh, even a, a while ago, this, so when I did my first book, um, it was about how black people were using technology to improve uh, their outcomes. So I wasn't focusing on the, the victimization part. I was starting with, okay, what are they doing uh, to improve themselves? So I was interested in, in those things. Actually, uh, that is actually a good example of a way moving forward. So the problem with, uh, so, so to answer your question, I, I just go with what I'm interested in. Uh, so, um, But uh, it is true that if, if people are eliminating a cultural uh, eliminating cultural discussions, then it'll be hard to generate questions about it, right? Because you can't even talk about it. That is true, what you were saying. But it might be that there are different ways of talking about this issue without it 
you know, pinging the racial, the racial antennas. See, see, there's some history in this. It was the case that people would use uh, culture to say, or they would say that black people's culture is inferior. Yeah. Um, so, so there's some there's some reason why people are hesitant. But some sociologists uh, uh, are trying to talk about culture in a way that doesn't paint one group as inferior to the other, yet we can understand the role that it plays on our lives. Because, I mean, it's obvious that culture matters. Um, you know, who, would, who, wouldn't, who wouldn't believe that? So, so what you have to do is, you know, in my perfect world, there would be scholars who would study culture, maybe in an abstract way, looking at how it impacts people, which we have done in the past. We've asked people, we've given them value surveys. What do you value in life? Or belief surveys. What do you believe about education or something? And then follow them later and see see what see, see if those values matter. Uh, you can do that, and it doesn't have to necessarily have a racial component and and cause people to think that it's racism. I think that's going to happen. Actually, uh, it's just going to take a little a little time. Um, but yeah, what's what do you think needs to change for that to happen? Like, is it a like a, just a shift in? A relaxation or just a different understanding that difference doesn't necessarily mean superiority or inferiority mm -hmm. it just it's disparity isn't tied to a moral value it's just a, a cause and effect thing right um, I just think it's just gonna be a shift in like we're going through the era of systemic racism so there have been three eras actually of uh, research hmm. relating to race uh, so, in the in the 50s and post World War II, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, in that era of you know just covert racism. I don't know, sorry, overt racism, uh, where people were just like, you know what, you know what, get this black guy out of here, this kind of stuff. You know, don't come here. So uh, we were sociologists and other social scientists were concerned about individual prejudice and discrimination uh, and stereotypes. That was a big thing. Okay, and. Um, Starting around the 80s, once you know a lot of laws are passed, once social norms changed, people stopped being overtly racist. Instead, we got what we call the cultural racism argument, wh where people would say, and by people I am, I am generally talking about white people, of course, would, would say, um, hmm. you know, um, I don't want to support this, this policy whatever it is, some kind of economic redistribution or affirmative action or whatever, scholarships for, for, uh, for black kids. I don't want to support this hmm. because the reason why they're doing so poorly is because of how they're behaving. So therefore, I'm not going to support this policy. That was seen as a kind of uh, racism argument, because it a cultural racism argument, because it's Im implied in that is that their patterns of behavior are inferior, and that is why, as a group, they're not doing so well. Okay, so sociologists dealt with this a lot in the 80s and 90s. It was during that time, actually, where we got the white fragility and the, and the whiteness studies, because it was all about what people were thinking and how mm -hmm. they orient themselves to the world. Okay, so now we're in the era of systemic racism, where now we're, we're moving, we've, we've still got all those levels, the covert prejudice discrimination, which people don't do that much anymore, which also explains why we can have this this conversation where someone says, oh, it's much better in the now than it was in the 60s. Clearly, you know, um, things are better. And they would be right because we don't, we've dealt with some of those or a lot of that overt racism. Okay. Uh, so, all right, we got that. Then we got the system, uh, cultural racism in the 80s. So the, so the systemic of now is all of those things in multi-levels. Okay, my thinking is, once that's over, you know, whenever that is, uh, then we might can move into saying, okay, fine, you know, we've dealt with a lot of this stuff. Um, now let's look at self-empowerment. So it doesn't have to be, you know, a racist argument. It can be, now let's look at yeah. ways of, of, of um, black people kind of, I don't know, self-improvement or something. So, yeah, it's uh, something's going to change. I mean, it That's just always does. 
I, um, that makes me think, I think we might be the same age. If you think you're an old man, I think I'm kind of on the cusp too, but we- I You think, have your hair, man. I'm, I'm 45. Okay, I'm 40, I'll be 44 in a bit. So we're, okay. we're so. solidly, I guess, like <laughs> late Gen X, kind of mid Gen X. And I that's think it, that it, we know, have a reality bites generation. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think we have a lot of like similar uh, prejudices or biases and just how we read uh, the conversation at present. And I, I mm -hmm. use prejudices and biases in a, in a more fluid term than they're normally used, just with regards to you saying, well, they're the, looking at the young generation working through what they're working through and saying, well, I don't see that. I don't see the world that way, and eventually it's not going to lead to, you know, what they think it will, but it will lead to something else. Um, that shift from the systemic, which I find is a very difficult position for activists to hold on to, because activism, when it is turned into protest, when it's turned into a group movement, when it's turned into a rave, when it becomes the chaz, right? When it becomes mm -hmm. manifested in, a, in group behavior, that level of detachment that is required to see a system, it dissolves. It collapses onto uh, this person is representing this group and this other person's representing that group. The, 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 it, it just seems to me that it's so far detached from direct personal experience that when people are so jazzed up, they can't actually affect any change on a systemic level. Maybe they can force change or cause a response mm. on the level of policy. Yeah, I think I think that's what's happening. I, I would not expect the uh, average protester to be having these high-minded, I mean, they, they may have some sense of what it means, systemic racism, but they, they I mean, uh, mm. Even I sometimes I'm not exactly sure um, <laughs> how to measure systemic risk. So so I don't know if, that, but but yeah, if um, if the if citizens make enough of a stink, something will happen. And so they've made enough of a stink that um, uh, our leaders are saying, okay, we got to do something. And so in that, they've actually already had some success. I don't know if it'll be lasting. I don't know if we'll have these wide-ranging changes that they want, but at least now uh, we're talking about it. I'm actually quite, quite um, proud of that, uh, of that movement, because it's like, oh, this is democracy here. I mean, I I'm not with the, you know, who, who, who likes rioting, right? But yeah, yeah, but yeah. The, the, the core of people saying, okay, I don't like this, and I'm going to be disruptive so that uh, my leaders will make a change. I find that, uh, I'm actually quite proud of that. What What's the change that you would want to come out of this? Like, if you were able to be the one who decided. <laughs> right, right. Um, well, I. So I don't know if we should be scapegoating police officers. So there's. I already know what's going to happen. It's going to be training. You know, let let's improve training and let's make it so that we can sue or fire cops more easily. That, that's what's going to happen. And um, I, I, fine, but to me that's, that's not really the issue here. The issue is uh, this, these vague you know, kind of systems, like uh, the policy that you know, we're supposed to, police are supposed to enter into a scene with all of this armor on this you know I mean that that's something that has uh, developed over time in this era of militarized policing the, the notion so so these are things that are hard to change and they're more cultural some of them are policy so like the there, there's this pipeline of military um, of uh, military materials um, being old military materials being given to police departments okay that was a policy. I think. I think either Nixon or Reagan put that into place. So, okay, that is a problem because those, those, those. Uh, I'm sure it's not supposed to be called materials. I just don't know what I'm. Equipment. Supposed to say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> of course, equipment. Yes. <laughs> so, so, so that equipment is is being deployed uh, in minority neighborhoods. And even if those, I mean, it's yeah. quite clear that there's a lot of crime going on there, but they're still American citizens. Do you really want to roll a tank down someone's uh, street? 
Um, do you really need these, like the things like the no-knock warrants? All of these uh, policies are put in place to deal with, in my opinion, it's sort of racialized. It's like, okay, hmm. during the 60s and 70s and 80s, there was demonstrable rise in crime, street crime and property crime. And it was concentrated in black and brown neighborhoods. So there was some empirical justification for dealing with that. And I think a lot of books have come out talking about how it was a lot of black people and politicians who wanted these tough on crime laws, who wanted to give police more leeway in dealing with crime. Okay, so so I, I, I get that. There was a, there was a, a push for that. But over the years, you've, you've, you've gotten all of these layers of policies and expectations about what police can do that ultimately lead to too many police tasing an 18 or 19 year old kid. Um, so for me, I would look at those policies and just try and get police to, to, to not be in those neighborhoods. Interestingly, I think what's happening is, and we can kind of get back to the cohort effects a bit, kids, kids 30 and younger they haven't had those experiences of, of a crack epidemic, of riots in the streets. You know, New York is safe. Um, uh, even when I was there, it was it was really safe. They had those, that broken windows policy. Police was everywhere. So so New York is is pretty safe. Where I live here in Virginia, is safe. so people don't think, oh oh, we need to have a tough on crime policy. Uh, they're not they're not thinking like that anymore. Um, they they just see what seems to be police as bullies. Okay. Yeah. And they might be right in 2020. We don't need those policies anymore. So what are you up to this summer then? Do you have a, you're doing that textbook and then? Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm working on. I got, um, it's textbook is going slow, but I'm trying to get it done. And, and I'm working with a graduate student on the uh, sex work and sex trafficking stuff. So, which has been fun because um, we get to go onto escort sites and, um, and look at the escorts and, and try and figure out if any of them have been forced. Um, we're trying to come up with a, um, huh. a set of measures. Yeah, because a lot of the um, women who are there are not there by choice. We know that. It's just hard to figure out who is there because they want to be escorts and who has a controller who is putting those things up. Huh. So what we're trying to do is come up with a set of measures that uh, we can give to police so they can narrow down their search when they when they try and uh, uh, look for sex trafficking. Are so you that's having, what we want to. Is there, uh, you're getting closer to those measures? Are there no. big nuts that you had to crack? <laughs> no, it's really difficult. Not at all. I mean, huh. we, we, there's some things that are, are, from prior research we know, we're just having a hard time seeing it. So um, we're trying to, so we know that... Um, controllers use burner phones. So what we're trying to do is figure out if we can tell from the phone number on the escort site if that's a burner phone. So that's one thing we're doing. We also know that um, hmm. if you are tr being trafficked, you often move from uh, city to city. So that's another indicator. So we want to put that in. And so the idea is that you can't predict exactly but if you can get like five or six of these indicators, then that's a strong possibility that that police need to investigate that a little bit more. Hmm. So so those are two that's in my head. I can't think of any more, but um, we're getting there slowly. And interestingly, I'm, we're learning more by reading the um, the affidavits that the F, that FBI or law enforcement write um, either for a search warrant or for an arrest warrant, because in that in that in that affidavit, they have to detail to the judge what evidence they have. Yeah. And so you start to see patterns, right? So um, that's wow. what we're looking at right now. And then we'll go online and, and try and figure it out from there a little bit more. Are you just crunching thousands upon thousands of these affidavits then? Is that kind of like one of the bulk uh, pieces of work yeah. that you guys do? Eventually. Right now, I've, I've looked at about 25. They're you know pretty dense things. So. Um, Wow. So you have to take a qualitative approach and just kind of read them first to get huh. some patterns down. And so, then if I notice patterns, then I'll do a wider search to make sure that it's accurate. And then he does a lot of the uh, computer stuff. He's a cybersecurity major. Cybersecurity. That yeah, man. Everyone, cool. It's a hot major. Is everyone, there something that you can, is there any tips that you can give to the average viewer about being cyberly safe? Sure, depending on what it what uh, what they want to protect. <laughs> okay, your so, Bitcoin wallet. Actually, I don't have any Bitcoin, so I don't even know. 
Uh, Always have an external hard drive. That's the easiest thing you can do. That, that's a that's simple thing. What do you mean? Uh, to run everything off the external or just have a backup? Just always have a backup. Yeah. 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 Which is an easy thing. It's like changing your oil. You know, you can do that every uh, week or so, backup stuff. And you probably do that. But that's that's one thing that you can do, certainly. Yeah. That's fair. That's cheap. But they're cheap. Hard drives are pretty cheap. Yeah, yeah. And it's an easy way. Use Brave because the Brave browser blocks a lot of the uh, ads. And a lot of times people end up clicking on things you know, because they think it's the real website, but it's an ad embedded in there, and often that that those ads have malware. So that's another easy thing that you can do. Hmm. Yeah, use a VPN. But 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 because I live or I, or I teach a lot of working class students, when I do talk about cybercrime, I try to find cheap things. So Brave is cheap. The external hard drive is you know, get one for eighty, ninety bucks or less. Um, people like to use VPNs, but they cost. So I try to. Or find ways of of uh, getting around having to pay for too much stuff. So, but yeah. What's your favorite VPN? I, maybe we'll get some ad revenue from them. And <laughs> no, I don't use I don't, I don't I don't use VPN. But I would tell I would tell someone who doesn't mind to use a Linux machine. Uh, those have less uh, viruses, but they can yeah. be hard to uh, hard to navigate. So a lot yeah. of work on the front end. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for uh, joining me. I hope you keep on producing content and uh, getting your getting your ideas out there. Are you yeah, having man, fun doing it. that? I do. I do. It's it's nice. The whole process. Um, did, even did though no one the... watches, I still like to do it. <laughs> <laughs> People start it's watching. Fun. You just yeah. have to you have to figure out which beehive you really want to commit to poking, and then then you'll get your. I see. Your okay. Audience. <laughs> Wait, did did your Zoom classes kind of inspire you to do this? Like, what? Why do I need students there? I can just talk to the internet. This is a easy peasy. Oh no! I, I I was well. I had that YouTube channel for like two or three years. Okay. Um, in the first two years, it was me talking to other scholars for my class. Oh okay. So so I would, I would teach a class on cybercrime and you know some things I don't know. So I would invite someone to talk about it. Oh, cool. And so that's how it started. And then after a while, I realized, hey, you know, I don't I don't mind um, talking in front of a camera. So started making my own stuff. Yeah. Fun. Cool. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks a lot, Rod. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I'll let you know when this is up. Okay. Um, what do I do? I do anything now? Am I, am no. I done? Well, you can say goodbye if you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It was a nice. It was a nice conversation. I appreciate it, man. Have a good Absolutely. one. Absolutely. You have a good one too. Talk to you later. Uh -huh. Bye. Congratulations for reaching the end of the podcast. If you enjoyed this product, consider donating to this channel via paypal.me slash Benjamin Boyce or joining me on Patreon. Also follow me on Twitter at Benjamin A. Boyce. Have a good night.